Have you ever noticed that when the flowers start to bloom and the weather warms up, we start to see a lot more honeybees? Some days they seem to be everywhere. I have noticed that a lot of people share a fear of bees. People's fears can range from being slightly nervous around bees to an actual phobia. Phobias are a common type of anxiety disorder and the fear of bees is called apophobia. Most people who have a fear of bees do not necessarily suffer from apophobia. Most of the time, a fear of bees comes from misconceptions or lack of education about bees. Today I am going to help you with your fear of honeybees. That does not mean I am accusing you of being afraid of bees, but at least one person watching this is, and that is what I'm here for, to help educate you. Yes, bees can seem a little scary. I mean, all bugs are a little scary, and bees sting. Some people are allergic, and so for those people, a healthy fear of bees keeps them safe. Even so, you don't have to be afraid. Get it? You don't have to be afraid. <laughs> Bee stings are painful, but many things hurt in life, such as falling and scraping your knee or your hands. You just get back up, and falling doesn't stop you from walking and running unless it's really bad. Honeybees are not aggressive. Like you, they just want to mind their own business and don't want some big thing to start flailing around, because to them, it looks like you are attacking them, and they have to defend themselves at the cost of their life. You might wonder, why would you defend yourself at the cost of your life? Because the whole point of defending yourself is not to die. But bees don't think the same way you and me do. They run off instinct only, so they don't know stinging you will kill them. Let's start with some basics. How do you know the flying insect you have encountered is a honeybee? Bees have bristles on their forelimbs. They have two compound eyes which cover most of their head. Between those eyes are three simple eyes that give the bee light intensity information. Bees are furry. These hairs are receptors that the bee uses to sense movement. It is the bee's way of hearing. Unlike honeybees, wasps and yellow jackets are aggressive and have the ability to sting more than once. Wasps and yellow jackets look different from bees and can fairly easily be identified. Wasps have little or no hair and typically have yellow and black bodies. Yellow jacket workers have little hair and do not carry pollen. Bees are fatter, whereas wasps are thin and long. Yellow jackets use a side-to-side -side flying pattern prior to landing. So now that you know how to tell a honeybee apart from other stinging insects, what should you do if you encounter a bee? Bees might come near you and seem to be attacking, but they just want to check you out. They are attracted to bright colors and scents similar to flowers. If a bee lands on you, remain calm. They're probably just checking out your scent, or maybe even getting a drink of water if you have been sweating. The bee will eventually leave on its own. If you cannot wait for the bee to fly away, you can gently and slowly brush it away with a piece of paper, or gently blow on the bee like a soft breeze to encourage it to move. If you see lots of bees together or if they start to fly towards you, cover your mouth with your hand and quickly but calmly get away. Do not swat at bees. This will aggravate them and increase your risk of being stung. If you are stung, seek shelter indoors or in a car right away. Bees release a pheromone that only bees can smell and when they sting, that can attract other bees. If you know you are going out somewhere where you may encounter honeybees, there are steps that you can take before you go out to reduce your chance that a bee will be interested in you. Avoid perfumes, soaps, and shampoos with strong scents. If you smell sweet, bees will be interested in you. If you have long hair, put it in a ponytail. It is possible that if a bee lands in your hair and it is loose, the bee can become trapped. Avoid clothing that is brightly colored or has lots of patterns like flowers. Bees are also attracted to very dark colors. Colors that are best to wear around bees are khaki, beige, or blue colors. Snug fitting clothing, pants, and long sleeve shirts can help protect you. I am here with Stefan, who is a local beekeeper in the San Jose area. In addition to honey, Stefan also helps with safe swarm removal and bee education. Stefan, yeah. can you tell me about, your, about yourself and how you became interested in beekeeping? Well, I'm, I'm an electric engineer, so nothing at all about beekeeping. Um, but a colleague of mine at work, he started talking about bees and gave me a jar of honey and said, oh, this is really great. And then I read up about it and became really interested in how they live their life and how they, we, we depend on them and how they support us and all this. And then the next year I had one of those colonies in my backyard because I bought one. What do you like people to know about bees that they, that they may not know already? So the first thing is know your bee. 
and don't mistake a bee for uh, for, for for yellow jacket or the other way around. Um, that's the first thing. Yellow jackets are yellow and black. The other ones are gold and black. Uh, that's what the bees are. And bees, in a very 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 most of the cases, they're not aggressive at all. The only reason when they would be aggressive is you do something that threatens them. So generally, uh, those are the two main things. The other thing is appreciate them because they give you the supply. In, in, the, in the long run, they supply you a lot of food because they pollinate uh, vegetables and fruits and stuff, which you want to eat. So uh, try to take care of them as best as you can because they take care of you. Really cool. And do you feel that additional education about bees would be the best way to prevent an uneasy fear? Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of that. I have uh, every few months I have a bee education session here with customers and with people, kids as well as adults. They all need a little bit of help in educating, learning a little bit more about bees and losing the fear. Once you stick your nose really close, uh, we will see that later on, to the bees and see how calm they are. All of a sudden you look at the bees with very different eyes. So uh, yes, ed education, whether it's just written, but uh, pictures and all this is good, being with the bees is, better. is much better. So I can only encourage people go out and hunt yourself um, a beekeeper and harass them as long enough, long enough so they let you have a look at the bees. How does a hive work? Can you show me? I can show you. Uh, let's talk about it first in principle. So the, the hive itself is, a, uh, is the structure of a, uh, of a colony. Colony is the kind of family of, of, of bees. A hive is the structure of what they built. Um, so usually the way I, I, I supply them a, a home is where they are in rectangular boxes and there's frames hanging in there and they have an entry on the bottom where all the bees enter and exit. Yeah, It's just a little slot. Only the, uh, only the bees and really small mice can come in. Um, and they crawl up and deliver the honey and the pollen and then they go back out and uh, forage and collect some more honey. So they, they find their way by smell to their nectar. I have a very, very fine sense of smell to detect where is nectar that I want to eat. They fly out and find it and then fly back and drop it back off. And then once they found a really good source and they have, have, have optimized their path, that they don't have a zigzag course from the, let's say from the tree to, uh, back to the hive, the beginning, the mm -hmm. first few times they don't find the most optimal path. They optimize the path and once, once they know they have a really great path, they tell everybody inside about it, in the dark, without talking, just by doing a, what's called a wiggle dance. She, she dances at a, a certain angle towards the sky and a certain length and tells them exactly what angle towards the sun and how far they have to fly to get to that uh, uh, nectar source. and then. All the bees surrounding her, which is usually five or seven more bees, do the same thing. They fly to the same tree. And if they also think that they agree, then they all fly back and do the same thing. And all of a sudden, out of seven becomes 49 and wow. more and more and more and more. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of them fly to this one tree until the tree has been harvested. And then they find a new tree and it, the same uh, game begins. So that's how they find their way and communicate. So we shouldn't un un underestimate what's going on inside the hive. It's complete darkness. They don't talk. They vibrate and they smell. So they, they talk a lot with vibration. Sitting on the comb, whoever sits on that comb, when a, when a bee has something to say, she shakes the comb at a certain frequency and they communicate with the whole comb at once. There's several hundred, they talk together at once. Mm. <laughs> what? Yeah. That a... is really cool. I think so too. I thought bees only ran off instinct. Is yeah. that just instinct or do they actually think that they need to tell? Uh, that, I think that that is an instinct. Uh, so they don't think that, that way, that it's just na naturally their behavioral pattern. But they, they develop this in an evolutionary sense, small changes over the millions of years of where they do it. That got refined this way. And if we now as beekeepers think we get to be smarter, we, uh, we don't make them build their own comb. Instead of having a uh, uh, wax comb, some beekeepers put plastic comb in there. You take away the bee's cell phone. They can no longer communicate on that, uh, on that comb. I don't think that's a very smart idea. So I try to minimize the amount of plastic I can possibly use 
inside there and keep it as natural as I can so they can communicate best possible. And then when you do that, more bees will be able to, um, they'll be able to expand and then your yes. bee colony gets bigger. Bigger and then they really, they, they replicate as well. When, when, they, when let's say the two or three boxes that are full with bees, then they decide, you know, we're big enough, we're strong enough, we can split and swarm out and build a new colony. That's really what I want because I'm, me having bees is one thing, but I want the bees to become overall as a species more and more because there's so many are dying every, it's everywhere in the news. So the stronger they are, the more likely they are to replicate, the more bee colonies we have in California and in the world. Yeah. Do beehives actually look the same? Like, are there any types of beehives that actually look the same way like they do on like TV shows or stuff? Um, or is it, or is, do they, are they mostly in like boxes, ships like these? They're, if they're managed, what we call managed is by beekeepers managed. Yeah. Uh, they mostly look like this, uh, mm -hmm. rectangular boxes. Some, uh, there's a couple of other ways to keep bees, and it's they're called top bar hives. They have, they're, instead of the frame that I showed you before with, uh, uh, with all yeah. the comb inside, they just supply the top bar in wood, and the, the bees make the comb themselves. And it has certain advantages, certain disadvantages, but very few people do it. It's an even more natural, it's an actually very much more beautiful way to, to, to keep bees when you take it out. It's an organic view, so it's very nice. Those are really the only two major different ways to keep bees. Otherwise, in the wild, they do whatever they want. They go in the tree trunk and they fill it. If, if, if there's a cavity in the tree trunk, they fill up whatever shape in the tree trunk there is existing, they fill it in. And they live in it for years and years and years. They don't need this, but if, they, uh, if it's available, they take it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That. Well, how do you get the honey from the bees? After the bees delivered the honey in there and cap the cells, then the, let's say the whole frame is full with honey. I, first of all, there's a lot of bees still in, the, in that box. I need to get the bees out. Because I don't want the bees, I want just want the honey. Yeah, because you don't want to kill the bees. I don't want to kill the bees. So I put what, what, what's called a bee escape. It's, it's a, a little piece of wood which has plastic cones in there where the bees can only walk out and can no longer walk in. So when they're done depositing their honey, they walk down and they can't find their way back up. And after a day, the top box is empty. I take the box off, put a new box on, and then I have an empty, or I have a full box of honey, but without any bees in there. So, and then you put um, new honeycomb in there so yeah. and you take the bees out of their trap? Yeah, no, the, uh, the, the trap is just the bottom two boxes where they have their family anyway. So, uh, uh, the, the one-way street where they walk down on is, is the two bo bottom boxes is where they walk into. It. And I just take the one-way street back off and put, it, put a new box back on and then they march back up. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. That's... <laughs> so a lot like of little techniques, huh? <laughs> very many different ways to get honey from bees, to like yeah. not hurt them and like still yeah. get it from them and then not change their society at all. So uh, when, when I take the box full of honey out, I put it uh, in, in my garage where I have an extractor. I, I cr scratch open the tops of those cells again and uh, put the frames in there and spin it real fast. Yeah. And it runs down in the extractor, you put it in a bucket and from the bucket you put it in the jars. Um, I just noticed, what's that little water th cup Well, the water, water cup thing is, uh, yesterday I caught a swarm so one of those replicating events where they decided we're oh, too the, crowded, we're yeah. going somewhere else. So when I catch a swarm, it's a bunch of bees and they're kind of nervous because done just, I moved them into something new. It's the only time yeah. when I actually feed them something. It looks like water, it's water and sugar. So I give them a safe, comfortable, dark, dry home and I give them food. I just want them to stay and I want them to like it. It's the one time where I give them one liter of sugar water and from then on, they're all on their own. I never feed them again after that. Because you, I don't want to feed them sugar water because I want honey. I want them to, to get nectar, not the sugar water. Some beekeepers give them only sugar water and call the product honey. And I don't think it's really honey. It's just sugar water <laughs> and it doesn't taste very good. So 
good, good, uh, good thing you noticed it, yeah. So one time in their life with me, they get fed. Otherwise, they on their own. Because you don't want that sugar water to be good. Yes, mm. yes. You, we want honey, a tasty kind of honey, not a yeah. sugar kind of honey. Sugary honey. When you collect the honey, does it hurt the bees at all? They probably don't like it, but I don't hurt yeah. them. Yeah, they, they put a lot of work into it, and I take it from them. Here in California, we have so long summers and very short winters, and even in the winter, there's some uh, there's some flowers where they can feed on. So I don't feel bad about taking the honey because the the bees, I don't need to feed sugar when I take honey. In some other countries, but there's, the climate is more harsh. When you take a, a gallon of honey out, you need to feed them at least a gallon of sugar water so they can survive. So you give them the short end of the stick. You get the good stuff, you give them shitty sugar water. So here, because the, the, the summers are so long, there's so much honey, they put, it can overproduce so much. I'm happy to, produ uh, to take the honey and I'm not really hurting them, but I'm taking something from them that is really there. Do you use a smoker? If yes, I so, do. <laughs> how does it affect the bees? So, a uh, smoker is basically simulating to the bees that th their colony, their hive is on fire. Um, so, in a way, I freak them out for just a few seconds. And they turn around and go and try and eat some honey, some nectar from their own stores. During that time, they don't focus on me, but they focus on the nectar. But within a minute or two, all the, uh, all the smoke is gone. And I look around and say, hang on, I think I was wrong. And they put it back in. But during that minute or two, I can do ma manipulate the bees. And they don't focus on me. They focus on eating honey. That's why yeah. I do it this way. Um, Does it like affect the bees' like lungs? No, 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 no. no. Uh, do bees uh, have lungs? They, uh, they, they, they need to breathe. Um, and I don't know exactly whether they have lungs or not. but. Um, they, they, need, they need to get their energy, the, the, uh, so they, they have muscles that produce uh, uh, the movement of the wings and muscles need oxygen, so I, I would imagine they have lungs, but I don't really know. You caught me something, but I don't know, but I will read it up soon, as soon as we get out of here. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> what is your advice to people who are scared or nervous around bees? Um, they, the advice is number one, the bees will notice when you're nervous and when you're afraid. Kind of like they, dogs or cats. Just like dogs and cats, they actually, it, you attract them by being nervous. They are more curious or when you panicky, when you crazy going around them, they actually become more and more aggressive towards you because if you're moving around like a crazy man, they don't like that too much. Then, like a bear or something. So like a bear. So then you attract their attention. So number one rule is stay calm. Even though you're afraid, at least act like you are calm. Yeah. And if you are calm, most likely they will stay calm and they, uh, they will not go after you. Bees only go after you when you bother them. So that's the big deal. Um, it's kind of like someone when they're reading, they're having a great time, and then <laughs> you put a horn in their face. Exactly. And when you put a horn in their face, maybe they get up and hunt you down. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not fun for, uh, for bo both parties. So let's not do that. That's the, my rule number one, don't bother them. And as, as much as you can, stay calm around them. They yeah. paid back with not being aggressive to you. No problem. You're calm, they're calm. They're calm. Thank you so much for answering all these questions and just... You're welcome. Thank you so much for just helping. And sure, yeah, it's, my, it's fun for me too. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very <laughs> helpful. Thank you so much for your time today. In conclusion, bees are essential to our world and we should do what we can to protect them. Without bees, our world would be very different in a bad way. Let's review some important facts on how bees help our world. Honeybees are not aggressive and will only sting when provoked. Honeybees pollinate 70% of the world's food crops. They are essential to the ecosystem. Without bees, food crops would die. The animals that eat the plants 
that would be pollinated by bees would starve, and the carnivores that eat the animals would starve as well. Bees also pollinate the cotton crops that are used for making clothes and other textiles. Without bees, those crops would die as well. I hope that this video has helped if you have a fear of bees. Remember, bees are friends, not our foes.